morning, good morning. I'm excited to worship with you guys today, even if I'm not necessarily with you. Um, I just am really just wanting you to get how good God is. <laughs> he is just so good. Um, and if that's hard for you, we're going to praise over you. We're going to praise that for you. And I'm just asking God to break into you, to your heart today, and just allow him to wash over you with his goodness and his kindness and his faithfulness. So if you can, stand, um, change your posture, put your arms out as a receiving of his goodness, and let's worship together and praise the same.
The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Sing that again. Oh, my God will never fail. Because I'm going to see victory. circumstances, over your situations, every problem.
with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb You have chosen me I've been born again into your family, and your blood flows through my veins. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Cause I'm no I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God.
Good morning, Fusion family and friends. Thanks for tuning in with us. It was so nice to see some of you in person at our worship night that we had the beginning of the month. Um, it felt like old times being together um, and just gives me anticipation for when we'll be able to do that again. Um, and I'm really excited for the nice weather too because I feel like that gives us opportunities um, to meet outside and just be together um, in different capacities as a church family. I'm here this morning with you uh, to share just a quick reflection for communion. And I feel like the Lent season for me um, has made me um, remember um, this realization and this truth that I am in constant need of the Father. And yeah, don't get me wrong, it doesn't have to be Lent season really for me to realize this need. Um, I feel like I can think of many examples um, in my daily life where this comes up. Um, for example, when my words come out harsher than I had expected, um, I realize my constant need for the Father's gentleness. Or um, when my anxieties have crept in for the day and will not subside, I feel um, and realize my constant need for the Father's peace. Um, or if my patients have just completely worn thin for the day, I realize my need for the Father's grace. And um, yeah, those situations feel endless. I feel like I could keep giving examples of my constant need for the Father. But the hardest part for me is acknowledging that need um, and trusting um, that truth. So I realize that this is just a constant pursuit of trusting the Father, knowing that He sees my need um, he knows that need and he can fulfill that need um, if I surrender to him and give him that control. Um, and it really just brings me back to the story of the cross. Um, I just think about um, that greatest need that God fulfilled um, of being my savior. Um, and I need that not just once and for all, but constantly. And um, when I think about God's body that was broken and given for me, I recognize that need for a savior. And when I think about Jesus's blood that was shed on the cross, like for my impurities and my sins and on my behalf, he did that. Um, I realize that need for a savior as well. So um, as you join with one another for communion this morning, would you just take a moment to reflect and remember that truth um, that we are in constant need of the father and just surrender um, to that need. Um, I'm going to pray for us. Father God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for being our Father. Um, we thank you for your constant presence. Um, we thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And we just confess our need for you. And we just surrender to your will for our life, God. And we thank you for what you did on the cross, that you met that need of being our Savior. And we just ask that um, you would just fill us with more of your spirit, more of your presence, and allow us to be more like you and less of ourselves, God. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Well, hey, church family, I hope you're doing really well. I sure do miss you. Uh, can't wait to see you face to face, hopefully really, really soon. Uh, just a couple kind of announcement kind of things before we dive into the word today. First of all, I want you to know that Good Friday and Easter, we will be having online services. Uh, we would encourage you to invite some friends, either to watch kind of virtually uh, or, or together if you're able to do that, to learn about how Jesus has covered our shame and, and how he gives us a new 
new hope uh, and a new life. And so we, we really want to lean into the story of what Easter means, what the, what the significance of Good Friday and Easter means, and for you to be able to share the good news uh, with your friends. I'm going to tell you, church, I feel like uh, over the next couple months and the remainder of this year, God is going to plant some seeds um, in the lives of some people and that we're going to see a harvest down in the future, that God wants us to share the gospel, scatter the seed of his word around, and that we're going to see a harvest. And, and when I, what I mean by that is we're going to see people step into freedom. We're going to see people step into a relationship with God that unlocks the deepest desires of their heart and sets people free. I'm speaking this by faith right now because I believe it's true. It's just a, a burning sense that I have in my heart. So I want you to share the good news with people. I want you to invite people to hear the good news of Jesus because I believe that God is on the move and that he is going to uh, just win some people's hearts back to him. So do that. Uh, also, I want to let you know, we're going to be purchasing probably a, a, at least a thousand, but probably a little bit more Easter eggs. And what we want to do, rather than kind of host a big Easter egg hunt that everyone comes to a location, actually, we want to give those Easter eggs to you to be able to host Easter egg hunts in your neighborhood. We want to do this just as a way to bless our neighbors. You know, everyone's starting to come outside a little bit more now that it's warming up. And so if you'd be willing and able, we would love for you to actually uh, get a, just on your street, just among some neighbors, say, hey, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. You let us know how many you think you need. Uh, and we'd love to supply you with some eggs, maybe just to have in your front yard or your backyard and just have people do something kind of outside and come and grab some Easter eggs. So uh, more details will be coming about that soon. But I want to give you a heads up now. Uh, as a way just to bless and get to know our neighbors. So again, just a great opportunity to check in with people and you don't have to give us any money for it. We're going to give it to you. So we're excited to be able to do that and that God's given us the, the means to be able to do that. So watch out for more information about that. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive into the word. So Father in heaven, um, I just, I'm humbled today just to come before you and, and before your word, Lord, to Speak forth, Lord, the things that are true. God, the things that we know we can be anchored in. And I ask you, Jesus, for this, that this would be more than just a moment of gathering on Sunday morning, either alone or with people. That, that Jesus, this would be a moment where we encounter you, the living God, the resurrected Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I pray, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit in this moment to awaken hearts and minds to a reality that's beyond what they can comprehend, something that is um, uh, um, uh, something that they didn't even expect. And I actually, Lord, I pray that expectation and faith would begin to rise in the hearers today, rise in those who are watching today. God, that they would encounter you new and fresh in the word today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's dive in. So we're going to spend just another two weeks on this idea of first love. Uh, we're gonna do something really, really practical today. And then next week, I'm gonna cap off the series with kind of how, why I think we've been doing this all this time and what I think that God wants to grow uh, in us. But today is gonna be super, super practical. So if you're the kind of person that's like, hey, just tell me what to do, this message is for you. I wanna talk about how do we grow in our first love? How do we grow? If you say, gosh, I've been listening to you and I've been tracking this series and I know that God should be my first love. I should desire him uh, and, and be fully love him with everything that I am. And he should be more important than, to me. God should be more important to me than anything else in my life. But I just don't know. I'm not there and I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to grow in that. Today is your message. This is going to be hopefully really practical. So we're going to talk about how do we grow in our first love. But before we kind of get to the practical nuts and bolts of today, I feel like it's so important for us to get this down into our spirit, like into our gut so that we know it's true. And here's what, I, here's what it is. It's that the love for God flows from the love of God. Love for God flows from the love of God. That's kind of a weird little play in words, but it's so critically important. What I want us to kind of get our minds and our hearts around is that we actually can't love God 
the way he's meant to be loved, the way, the way that we were designed to love God, unless we fully understand God's love for us. It doesn't mean that we have to understand everything about God's love. But here's what I know is that, that, that most of the time, people who are like, yes, I love God with everything I am, have had some kind of revelation of God's love. They've encountered the God who has loved them. They have been uh, captured. Their hearts have been won over by a God who loves them. And so it's the appropriate response to love God back. And I know that usually when people struggle with loving God, it's because they really don't understand God's love. They don't understand just how amazing this God is and that this God of this universe chose you to be on this planet to love. You were created to be loved by God and to love him back. He had in his mind, I want this one to love me when he made you. And his love for you is beyond anything that you can actually wrap your mind around or your heart around. And so this conversation about loving God doesn't make any sense if you don't understand or believe that God really loves you. And so I just want us just to, to pause for a second and say, if you're struggling with this idea of, I don't know how to love God more, or I don't know how to give God more of myself, chances are, there's actually more of God's love that you need to discover. That what you need to focus in on is on who he is and what his heart is for you. And that if you focus your, your energy and attention on that, it will actually conjure up love in you. Your response to God's love will be love. Uh, John, one of the followers of Jesus says, we love God because he first loved us. It's not the other way around. We don't love God and then he loves us more. Actually, he completely and totally demonstrated his love for us on the cross, giving himself completely and totally for us so that we would know that we are loved, right? And so we actually need to kind of reframe our thinking and understand that our love from God for, for God, it actually flows from his love for us. That's the direction of his love. And the Apostle Paul on, on more than one occasions, when he's writing the letters in the New Testament, recognizes this. And, and he actually prays a prayer that people would understand the depths of God's love, that somehow there would be some unlocking in our hearts to understand just that, how much it is that God loves us. He understood that just talking about God's love is not enough. Just studying about God's love is not enough. Just hearing stories of how God loves someone else or how someone else loves God is not enough. We actually have to have a personal kind of encounter, an awakening in our heart where we recognize God's love. And so on one occasion in, in Ephesians chapter 3, this is how the Apostle Paul prays. He, this, is, this is his prayer. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, so all that God has in heaven, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. So I pray, basically, I'm going to break this down, that out of all the riches and all the strength that God has, that he gives you power to do something, to give you power to do something. And he's going to explain what that is. He says this, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Basically, as you give the Lord more of yourself, you get to have more, more of him. Your roots will go down deep into God's love and keep you strong. We're going to, supposed to be rooted in God's love. And this is, the, this is the line I love. And may you have the power. This is a prayer. He's asking God, praying for people. He said, may you have the power to understand, as God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep is his love. I, I, here's what he's praying. He's praying, I pray that no matter where you go or what you think about, that, that you would somehow be able to apprehend in the depths of who you are just how much it is that God loves you. And he prays this, may you experience, experience the love of Christ. Not just be able to talk about it, not just be able to say, yeah, I know God's loved me, but may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that's from God. Now, look, I know that's a mouthful, but you get the heart of it. 
The heart of it is this prayer that we would somehow experience God in a way that we would know that we are loved. And you know what? Actually, when I was preparing today and thinking about this, I felt like I just needed to pause right now in the middle of this message and actually pray this kind of prayer over you right now. So this isn't the end of the message. This is to unlock something in you so you can receive the rest of it is what it is that I feel like God has for us. So I'm just going to pause right now and pray this kind of prayer over you. So right now, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that Holy Spirit, that you would send your love into every home that is watching this right now. And I pray, God, that you would reveal your love to, to people in their hearts right now in measures that they cannot fathom or contain. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that people would feel the weight of your love in their hearts. I pray right now, Lord, as, as people are even maybe feeling like a, a sense of trembling happening in their hands or maybe even a sense of your eyes are tearing up and maybe you're even feeling like a little weepy. I pray in the name of Jesus that, that Holy Spirit, you would baptize us in your love today, that you would totally and completely reveal the heart of the Father for your people today. God, I pray right now for just a revelation of your love, that you would unlock the, 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 the hidden places in our heart, Lord, the places that we don't yet, we haven't yet experienced your love. I pray right now, even for those right now whose hearts may be hardened and may be saying, I'm not listening to this. I'm not listening to this. I pray right now that you would unlock it with truth right now in the name of Jesus and open up hearts and minds to receive the love of God. I pray that doubts would begin to fade into the background, that shame would begin to be covered, that guilt would begin to fall off. I pray, Lord, that every idea, every false idea about themselves and about you would begin to go right now in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. So heal every hurt, every wound, every block, every, every thought, Jesus, that's come against you right now in the name of Jesus. Let it drop so that we can experience the love, the incredible kindness of God. I pray for a wave of kindness to move over Fusion Church right now. In Jesus' name, a wave of kindness and mercy to, just to go over Fusion Church right now. Let them feel your kindness, Lord. Let them feel the weight of your glory and your kindness and your mercy right now. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, fill it right now. Fill every empty place with yourself that they might know the depths of your love. Right now, just come, Father. Come, come, come. In the name of Jesus. I know that right now, some of you are just, are, you, you're, you, the, the moment I start praying like this, you kind of begin just to turn down the volume. You don't want to go there. You don't want to hear this. You're not sure what it is that's happening. I mean, I'm just going to encourage you. Right now is the time to tap into the heart of God's love for you. Right now is the time to open yourself up. Right now is not the time to be hard and callous. Right now is not the time to say, I don't understand. Right now is the time to be loved by your Father. So open up every heart. Open up every place in your heart. I just encourage you now, if, if, if you feel like overcome with with, with tears, just to let those tears flow right now. That's just the sweetness of the Holy Spirit just ministering to your heart. When, when, um, when Jesus was in the wilderness, the angels came and attended to him. Right now, there's just places in your heart that, that God just needs to minister to. Don't, don't try to wrap your mind around it. Don't try to explain it. Just let it go. Right now, you might be feeling joy or laughter begin to bubble up. You might be experiencing a sense of, of, of hope that you haven't ex experienced before. A smile might be coming over your face right now. Right now, you might be feeling like shaky or trembly. You might feel like your skin is cold or hot. All of these are just things that can happen when God begins to move. So I just encourage you right now, if God's just doing something, pause the TV, pause YouTube, pause Facebook. And just let God do what he's going to do right now. I just trust you. I, I trust God that he's going to do what, he, what needs, to, needs to happen. Just pause right now and then come back when you're ready. Seal whatever's from you, Lord. Amen. 
All right. I feel like that was so important that we would do that because if we talk about these practices that I'm going to give you today, then they're just going to be religious practices that we add and they might be really helpful, but they won't be coming from a a loving response to God's love. They'll be actually something that we're kind of working in our own strength and ability to do and, and they're going to take us sideways. So we don't want to do that. We want to respond to God's love with love. And I want to give you a couple kind of practical things that are going to help us to be able to do that today. So here's the, here's the basic idea, the kind of framework for, for these few little simple ideas I'm going to give you. And, and, and it's this, it's that first love. So our first love grows with investing first fruits. Our first love will grow when we invest our first fruits. Let me unpack this a little bit. First fruits is actually just a, a, a simple biblical idea that runs all through the scriptures, that we give God the first and the best of what it is that we have. It starts all the way in the beginning with Cain and Abel, this famous story where two brothers come and present a sacrifice to the Lord. They bring an offering. Before God has even said, hey, bring an offering before me, these brothers know that they're meant to bring the first fruits. They bring the, the, uh, the, fir- the first of their crops, and then Abel brings the first of his, um, his flock. And, and without getting into the details too much of this story, one presents the first and the other presents both the first and the best. And God shines down on that, on that sacrifice that Abel offers of both the first and the best. And this idea of offering something to God of our first and our best runs all throughout the scripture. It's simply a way of saying, God, everything that I have came from you. It all belongs to you. So I'm just, I'm just giving you the first and the best of what I have as an acknowledgement that this is all a gift from you. And then also I'm trusting you, God, that you will continue to do this again. It's just a simple idea. And this plays out all throughout the Old Testament. So Abraham is given the son Isaac and God asks him in this, in this wild story to be able to offer back this firstborn son, Isaac. And then it happens, uh, happens again with Moses and the, and the Israelites after they're freed from slavery in Egypt and they're getting ready to enter into the land. God asks them to kind of dedicate or consecrate all the firstborn in the nation of Israel, all the firstborn sons in the nation of Israel, I believe it is, as a way to just say, God, it's all yours. And then as God is giving the law in in the Old Testament, he begins to kind of lay out exactly this even a little bit more clearly uh, that we should take the first tenth, a tithe. That's where the idea comes from, the tithe, the first tenth. So the best and the first of what God has given us and give it back to him as an offering. And again, that idea runs through all the Old Testament so that when the Old Testament ends, actually we have this incredible promise from God. It's the only time God ever says to test me. And he says, look, if you will give me your 10th, your tithe, your first and your best, if you'll give that to me, test me in this, test me and I promise you, I will bless you. It's this incredible idea. Well, Jesus takes this idea to a whole new level in the New Testament. So so our first and our best isn't just 10%. It's actually everything that we have. And Jesus would say, seek first the kingdom of God and all the stuff that you want, all of it will be added to you. So this idea of first fruit basically says the first and best of whatever it is that I have, I'm offering it to God as a way to express my love and my devotion as well as my trust. So again, a symbol of love and devotion to God, that's what first fruits are, and a symbol of trust. I know that you'll supply all that you need. It's this clear idea that love is expressed through offering what is first and what is best. We offer God to this and it demonstrates our love. Now, that's typically the way that we think about kind of making an offering or giving something to God or giving a gift. It's a sign of how I feel. So I give an offering or I serve God in a particular way, and it's meant to be an expression of how I feel. Because we know that our treasure flows from our heart. So um, when we give a gift, 
We know that that often flows from our heart. When we give our first fruit, it was intended that it would flow from our heart, that this would actually be this outward sign of a way that we feel. That's totally the right way to think about that, that treasure flows from our heart. And while that's true, uh, Jesus has this um, idea. While that's true, that treasure flows from your heart, Jesus has this other idea, that your heart actually follows your treasure, that your heart actually follows your treasure, that where your first fruits are given, your heart and your love will actually increase. That's, that is like to think about the more we pour out our time, our talents, our treasure, it actually does something to us. It actually forms us that when we give of our first fruits, we actually grow in our love and our devotion. Here's the way I would think about it. Wherever, where or how we invest our treasure, it forms our heart. So it doesn't just flow from our heart. It actually forms our heart. That giving of our first fruits actually helps us grow in our love for God. Here's the way that Jesus talks about this. this is Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 20. We actually read this a few weeks ago, so it should be somewhat familiar. He says this, Don't store up treasures on earth. So don't give your money, your time, your energy to simply things here on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, this is the key idea, your heart will be also. So wherever you invest, wherever you put your time, your energy, your money, all that kind of stuff, your heart is actually going to grow there. And so here's this key idea I want to I want to draw out today is that when we give of our first fruits, and I'm going to break that down a little bit, what specifically I mean, when we give of our first fruits, it actually helps us to grow in God being our first love. It's not just an expression of our love. It's not just a way of something to say, God, I love you so much. It's actually a way that God is forming our hearts and love for him. So our treasure follows our, our, I'm sorry, our heart follows our treasure. That is what Jesus is saying. Let me just give you a little bit of a practical example of this. Uh, So when I was going through seminary, I was a window washer and I lived in Arlington Heights And one of the jobs in the areas that I would wash windows was in Fox Lake. And so I would drive from Arlington Heights to Fox Lake on Route 12. And coming up Route 12, I would pass this name, this town with a funny name called Wakanda. And I would see the sign, I would see the McDonald's arches and the old abandoned, what used to be the Dominic's building and now is the, another storage facility. And I would see these buildings coming kind of uh, through Route 12. And honestly, I never gave a thought to anything that was in Wakanda. Uh, I thought, ah, oh, that's a town with a funny name. No real interest to get to know anything about it. I didn't know that there was a beautiful lake. And I didn't know that all of you beautiful people would be living in Wakanda and the Island Lake area. It was just something I drove right past, right up to Fox Lake. Until we started hanging out with Fusion Church. We started meeting people from Wakanda. And we started hanging out in Wakanda. And we started spending time at restaurants and and at at coffee shops here in town. And we started serving here. And slowly but surely, this town that I drove by, I mean, dozens and dozens of times, if not hundreds of times, going back and forth to Fox Lake over the course of a couple years, all of a sudden, this town that didn't mean anything to me started to actually really capture my heart. And it wasn't just that there were so many likable things about Wakanda. It was actually that I had invested so much time and energy and relationships here in Wakanda. It was that I started to have a story that's tied to this place. And this place that I used to drive by all the time actually really has grown in my heart. So much so that I felt like when God called us to to be pastors of Fusion Church, I felt like he called us to this community as much as he did to our church community. See, I invested treasure here and my heart began to grow. I invested treasure here and my heart began to grow. Same thing about the house where I live. And I drove by the house where we live right now a, a, a few times before. Never thought a second chance of it. And you know what, guys? There's nothing special about our house. 
It's nice that we live next to a football field and that we have a pool, but our house is actually kind of small. There's lots of broken stuff in it. Like there's really nothing special about it. But because we've invested relationship and time and we've got stories in that house, I don't ever want to leave Brown Street. I love our home, but it's because of the investment that was, that was there. And I think that Jesus knew this. He knew that where we, and God knew this way back before, that where we invest our time, our energy, our resources, that our heart actually grows in love for that. So that's why this idea of first fruits is so important. Where we invest the first and the best, we're actually going to grow in our love for God. So let me give you quick, this is really quick, four areas where you can invest your first fruits to grow in first love. So the first one is this, the fruits of treasures, the fruits of our treasures. Quite simply, your finances. It, when, when we make a choice to invest and to give God the first and the best, that first 10% or that tithe that we talk about, when we choose to do that, we are not only saying, God, this belongs to you and thank you. We're saying, God, I trust you with the rest of it. And when we choose to do that, and we do that over, the, over a period of time, uh, it actually begins to help us to realize that God is the source of our provision, that God is going to be the one that takes care of us and blesses us, that it's not just my hard work and my labor. And actually, uh, sometimes it reveals this kind of unhealthy relationship that we have with money. It, actually, with all these practices I'm going to give you, when uh, when we start to give the first and our best in one of these areas, it's going to reveal our relationship to that thing. And it's interesting that Jesus talks most frequently about people's relationship with money. Almost more, well, certainly more than any other area, any other kind of vice that people can struggle with. It is finances. Because money has so many different attachments. It's, not, it's never just about the dollars. I mean, I guess it kind of is at sometimes. But money is a means for status. I have a certain amount of money. I have a certain kind of status. Money is a means for kind of recognizing an accomplishment. So I've, I have so much money. Look at all the stuff I've accomplished in life. So even if nobody else knows it, but you know there's a lot of money in your bank account, you can have a sense of pride over that. So money can be a sense, be tied to our accomplishments. Money can be a tied to a certain kind of lifestyle and comfort that we want to have. So to give away money actually feels like we're actually threatening that comfort or that lifestyle that we want. Money can be tied to safety and security. I need to have X amount of dollars so that I can be safe and secure. Now, none of those things on, the, on their own are bad, but Jesus is oftentimes hitting at this idea that our relationship with money actually reveals something about what's going on in our heart. And so the idea of giving our first fruits or our tithe over to God is actually kind of we're pushing back the, 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 the hold that money can have on us. We're actually giving over our first and our best to God in order to create space for us to realize how much it all comes from him and flows from him anyway. And so it feels like a little odd to think about this, how this can actually grow our love. But if we grow an understanding of who God is, and how he provides for us, we will grow in our love for God. And so this idea of investing our first fruits, giving our first and our best over to God, specifically in the area of finances, will have a result that you, or can, I should say, have the result that you will grow in your love for God. Practically speaking, this happened for us when uh, a few years ago, we felt like God was asking Jen to, uh, to step down from her uh, position as a teacher. Uh, we lost uh, our income, uh, our, all of her income, which was more, as half of what our household was bringing in. We lost our health insurance. We lost our life insurance. We lost all of these different things, and it was really difficult. And the temptation was to stop tithing, stop giving God our first fruits because where's it going to come from? We were having a hard time paying bills before. Now, how are we going to do this? But we had this conviction. We had people pray for us and they all said, we think that this is crazy, but we think this is what God is saying too. And we said, we're going to continue to tithe. We weren't perfect. I'm not, I'm not saying we were perfect in it, but, but we, we did our absolute best to give God our first and our best. 
And what we saw was this incredible provision for God in our lives. We actually ended up with having more money after Jen quit working than we had before she was working. And as we did that, we got to experience a whole new aspect of God as our provider that we had never experienced before. We grew in our trust, and this is all about growing in relationship with God and understanding who he is. So the simple act of choosing to continue to give of our first fruits, even though it was hard, even though it was difficult, helped us to grow in understanding of who God was. And as we grew in our understanding of who God was, we grew in our love for God because we invested our treasure and our heart followed that treasure. So let me encourage you, if you are not a person who has taken up the practice of tithing, of giving God your first fruits. Now is the time to start. Now's the time to start. And look, this is, uh, I know that, that talking about money is a tricky thing uh, for people. And so if this is something that you are like, hey, I'm confused about this. I don't understand how this works. I would love to talk to you. Your village leaders, if you're in a village, would love to talk to you about this. We would love to unpack this any way for you. Not because the church needs your money, although God does supply the needs of our church community through your tithes and offerings. That's, what not, that's not what this is about. What this is about is you growing in love for God by investing your first and your best. And again, this is the only promise that God ever says, test me, see if I will actually do this. So I just encourage you to take God as his word. I've never known anyone, anyone in my whole life who has consistently given God their first and their best, who God didn't take care of completely and totally. So the first fruits of our treasure. The second is the first fruits of our thoughts. The first fruits of our thoughts. You know, Mark talked about our mind a few weeks ago and how, uh, how important our mind is. It's that kind of gateway to everything else. So if we want to grow in our love for God, one of the key things is that we have to make sure that we're giving God the first and the best of our thoughts. And Mark touched on this a little bit. One of the best ways that you can do this is by giving your first thoughts in the morning over to God. Your first thoughts in the morning over to God. So rather than just pick up your phone and check the latest headlines, rather than come downstairs and just turn on the TV and kind of put the news on, what if instead you put your very first thoughts in the morning to God and his character? One of the best ways you can do this simply is just to read the scriptures, read the Psalms, spend a little time reflecting on them, not just reading them and kind of, okay, I did my thing, but, but what does this actually mean? What does this actually tell me about who God is? What does this actually tell me about the way the world works and, and who I am? Because fixing our first thoughts on who God is, giving him that first fruit, is actually going to inform our, our perception of how we see the world. We're gonna, it's going to help us to see what's happening and discern what's happening in our lives. So giving God the first fruits of our thoughts, the very first thoughts of a day, actually really change the atmosphere of our entire day. And it helps us to see God at work, see who he is throughout the day. So let me, let me differentiate this. This is not just about getting up and telling God what you need for the day. Although there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with getting up in the morning and saying, God, I need this. Thank you. And please do this. That, that can be good. But actually, if you want to grow in the depth of relationship with God, it's actually celebrating who he is. It's actually reminding ourselves of what is true about who God is and about who we are. So let me encourage you to fix your thoughts on Jesus first thing in the morning. For me, sometimes this looks like taking a, a character attribute of God and for a period of time, uh, making sure that that's the first thing that I'm reading about in scripture or studying in a Bible app or something like that. Or sometimes it looks like taking a specific psalm over the course of a week and reading that psalm every day, meditating on it, this allowing, my, allowing it to form my mind and letting it actually penetrate my heart. Sometimes it's actually like the Bible talks about taking every thought captive. So I realize when I wake up in the morning, my thoughts are running here and there and everywhere. And I realize I have so much to do. So for me, a lot of times just pausing and saying, Jesus, this morning, you are Lord over everything that will happen today. You are king. And, and, I, and I, I, I refuse to give myself over to worry. And so, Lord, would you help me to see that you are trustworthy today, that you will take care of. It just kind of sounds 
and looks a little bit like that. And again, I would encourage you, there are all kinds of resources that we can help you with this, but just make the first step in saying, you know what, my first thoughts in the day, I'm going to give those to God and then see what happens. So real practically uh, for me, uh, lately, uh, coming out of last year, which is an incredibly difficult year for our family, I know it was for many people, but we, we just had a brutal, a brutal 2020. And one of the things that uh, has been important to me is just recognizing that God is fighting for us. And so there's this phrase in the Bible in the Old Testament that, that God, he's the God of the angel armies. And so I've just been meditating on that phrase because I don't think about God as a general. <laughs> I don't think about God as, as this warrior like that. I, I think of God as, this, as a tender father most of the time. But right now in my life, I'm needing to be reminded that he is the God of angel armies and that he is fighting for us before I ever do anything. And as I've been like meditating on that, it's actually opening up my heart and my mind to see God in a different way. And as I see God in this different way, just by fixing my first thoughts in the morning on this, it's actually opening my love up for God because my heart is following my treasure. So the treasure of your thoughts. Next is the first fruits of your time. First fruits of your time. I want us to think about two different ways of thinking about this. The first fruits of our time. So you can think about time in terms of quality or quantity. So the way that we give God the first fruits, the first and the best of our time in terms of the quality is to actually think about what's your favorite time of the week. What's your absolute favorite time of the week? For me, it used to be Monday mornings because I was, you know, gone through a full week and we'd have church on Sunday evenings. And then Monday mornings was just a time where, okay, that week is behind me. I have a little bit of, of bandwidth now. And so Monday mornings, I know for many people, they hate Monday mornings because it's getting up and going to work. For me, it was like actually the beginning of kind of like a weekend for me. And so Monday mornings was like a, just a time where I could slow down and just kind of chill. And I recognize that I could choose to do stuff with that Monday morning that was just about me, or I could choose to give that Monday morning time to God because it was my first and my best time that I had. And so I felt like, you know what, this is the time I could give over to God. Now it's looked a little bit different. Actually, now it has looked a little bit more like Friday evening or Saturday evening. Those are my favorite times. They're the times where, where I just really enjoy being alive and there are things that I enjoy doing. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I've decided to do, rather than just use those times that I really enjoy for my own personal benefit, is to actually say, God, I want to meet you in these times. I actually want to experience you in these times. And so giving God the first and the best in terms of the quality of my time and saying, God, I want to spend this time that I love with you has been great. And so for me, like that might look like right now, once the kids are going to bed and Jen's falling asleep because she, she typically goes to bed before, falls asleep before I do, is putting on a record and reading a book or reading my Bible or just reflecting on the week, just talking to God. It could be anything. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but give God the first and the best in terms of quality of time. What is your favorite time to be awake? All of you have it. You, have all, you all have a favorite time. If you've never thought about this before, your favorite time, I would just encourage you to give that time over to Jesus and spend time with him. The second part of that is quantity of time. Quantity of time. So not just quality, but quantity. One of the things that is interesting to do sometime, if you ever have uh, a few minutes to do a little of this exercise, is actually take the 24-hour period in a day and the seven days in a week and just kind of map out what do you do with each hour? What, what do you spend your time with? And, then, and do this little audit. I mean, I've done this many, many times before, and I've done this with many people who I've discipled before. And it's pretty amazing what we spend our time doing when you start to list it all out. The, every hour in the week and how do I spend this hour? It's amazing how we spend time doing stuff that's just goofy, that's just a waste of time. And it's also uh, amazing how much, um, how sometimes we cram so much into so little time. It, it just blows my mind. 
And so one of the ways that I feel like that we can grow in our first fruits of time is to look at our schedule and actually look at the quantity of time that we're spending with God compared to doing other things. So if you are only spending 10 to 15 minutes in prayer every day with God, that is a great start. But if you're watching three to four to five to six or however many hours of Netflix or Hulu or whatever, there's a major disparity there. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you need to be the kind of person who starts to pray for five or six hours. That's, that's not it. If so, awesome. You are on our intercession team right now. All right. That's great. Uh, I'm not saying that that's, you have to have the quantity of time matched. I'm saying we should just be aware of the quantity of time that we're putting into other things versus the quantity of time we put into our relationship with God. So one of the things that we can do is just start to align that and say, God, I want to give you the first and the best here. So I want to bring, I want to bring back a little bit more alignment there. And you may even feel, and I know many of you have done this before, that you're going to just, you're going to really push aside lots of other distractions and spend more time with God. For me, uh, over this Lenten season, actually going back to the beginning of the year, it has looked like I'm not going to watch TV when my family has gone to bed during the week, and I'm not gonna listen to the radio, I'm not gonna listen to talk radio, I'm not gonna do those kinds of things. I'm not gonna spend all of my dead downtime, this quantity of time I have doing other things. Instead, I'm gonna use that time just to be still, to listen for God's voice, maybe to read my Bible. And it has been amazing. (laughs) I have actually discovered that he is way more present and speaking way more than I thought because I've actually given him better quantity of time, not just the quality of time, but I've actually given him more quantity. And the times where I would maybe want to do this, I'm actually choosing to do spend time with him. And I'm telling you guys, I'm falling more in love with Jesus simply by investing the, the, the treasure of my time in this. So if you wanna grow in love for God, then the reality is it's just gonna require giving the first fruits of your time. So think about that for you. And the last one I'm going to give you is the first fruits of our talents. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, we're going to, going to land this plane right now. But uh, if you go back and listen to the message about strength a couple weeks ago, I really kind of highlighted this, that we all have different things that God has wired us and created us to be able to do. And all of those things are ways that we can express our love and our devotion to God. So whether you're a painter or a writer, or a musician, or a mechanic, or a builder. It doesn't matter what it is. We all have different kind of talents that God has given us. And when we give him the first and the best of those talents, we actually can experience something of God that we wouldn't otherwise. So many of us use our talents and our abilities to, for so many other things. But what if instead we looked at what we God has given us and looked at it as an opportunity to express our love and our devotion to God, whatever it is, even if no one ever sees it, it doesn't have to be something that's this great thing for other people to see. It's just simply offering what I have to do to God. And for me, you know, I mentioned this last week, I don't have a lot of skills. I'm not really good at a lot of things, but I've been given the opportunity to study God's word and, and, and to be able to dive into messages like this. And so this year, I felt more of a conviction that because God has given me this opportunity, I need to dedicate myself more to study and to theology and like those kinds of things. It's, um, I know that this ability that I have is not just something that just anybody could do. It's unique uh, because of the opportunities that I've been given in life. And so I have an opportunity to love God by dedicating myself to understanding who he is and to understanding his word a little more deeply. And so this year I've given myself more, given my first and my best, more to reading books about theology or reading books about biblical studies or kind of like Christian classics and stuff like that. And I can feel, I know this sounds weird, but I feel my love and my appreciation for God growing, my understanding of his word growing. And it's not just about knowledge. I'm actually growing in love for God because I'm, I'm diving deeper into these dimensions of who he is. And if maybe, let's say you're a painter, if you begin to say, God, you know what, I'm I'm going to dedicate once a week to painting painting something or to drawing something, 
that is simply just letting you know how much I, I love you and how much I appreciate you. I'm just going to do that. I guarantee you, you're going to discover something different as the, the paint hits the canvas or the, the pencil hits the paper. It, it doesn't matter what it is. What matters is that whatever talent you have, you offer the first and the best to God, not out of a sense of obligation, although he is owed it all, but actually out of a sense of, God, I want to learn how to grow more in you. Now, again, I want to mention this because I think this is so critically important. If we, if we start to lean in to these first fruits, and we start to try to uh, kind of figure out how do I give God the first and the best in these areas? My time, my talents, my treasure, my thoughts. It's going to reveal other things that you value. Right now, whatever your first and your best is being given over to is occupied a place in your life. And if you begin to give God that space in your life, it's going to reveal that there are some click conflicting values about your time, about your resources, about all that kind of stuff. But I just want you to remember that that's okay because Jesus um, uh, isn't uh, ashamed uh, or uh, frustrated with you for holding these things back. That he's just leaning in and saying, yeah, this is what I want. I, I knew all along that there was this thing occupying a place in your heart that only love from me is meant to occupy. And so I'm so glad that you're recognizing that this is a challenge. So I want you to be so gracious with yourself. Uh, as, you, uh, as you're kind of pressing into some of this and giving yourself over to one of these kind of uh, first fruits to give over to God. I want to encourage you to stick with it. This is not going to be a one week long kind of practice. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is maybe pick one of these areas that I've mentioned today and just say, yeah, I think I'm going to start really focusing in on giving tithe or I'm going to really start focusing in on giving, getting up and giving my first thoughts to God. F take one of these areas and don't just do it for a week. Don't just do it for two weeks. Take a month and just stick with it and just see what happens in the course of your life. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that if you create space if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. I guarantee you. And then lastly, I want you to remember this, that this is not, these practices are not about trying to make God happy. These practices, these giving God our first fruits are not trying to prove anything to God. They're not trying to convince God that we're worthy or, or, or try to earn any kind of righteousness or goodness. None of that. This is all about posturing our minds and our hearts to understand more of who he is. This is an invitation to relationship, not a responsibility to a religion. I want you to hear that. This is about an invitation to a relationship, not a responsibility to a religion. And a lot of times when a, a married couple are trying to sort out, why do we get married? <laughs> Why are we doing this in the first place? Sometimes they have to go to intentional practices to learn the love language of, of their husband or of their wife. They have to actually put some intentional time and energy into these different areas to actually understand this is how you've made my wife. This is how you've made my husband. This is how you've made me to love them. Well, look, God's love language is whatever you express to him. So he's not looking for you to fit into a box that so-and-so fits into. He's just asking you to give him the first and your best in these different areas so that you can discover more of who he is so that his love can fill your heart and his love can change your heart. And to be really clear, God hasn't stopped pursuing you. He's not done chasing you. He is, is not upset with you for any of these areas. He, his face is turned toward you. His love is completely for you. And he is pursuing you with a relentless love. All he's asking for you to do is to turn your face toward him and meet him in these first fruit practices and see what happens. So today I want to close with this. I want to close with this, uh, this prayer that's a part of the prayer of St. Patrick. It's going to be St. Patrick's Day this weekend. We've just had this tradition. I'm going to read a different portion of that. This is a blessing that I want to pray over you and just ask that God would do this. Here's what it says. Arise today through God's strength to pilot you, God's might to uphold you, 
God's wisdom to guide you, God's eye to look before you, God's ear to hear you, God's word to speak to you, God's hand to guard you, God's way to lie before you, God's shield to protect you, God's host to save you. Arise and go today. He's for you and he's with you and he's inviting you into an incredible story with him. God bless you today. Thank you.